Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is doing a CGC Signature Series signing opportunity for fans. You can send in your stuff to Alex to sign at CGC.com for details. Hurry, though. The offer ends May 5th. Word Balloon is also brought to you by my patrons, the League of Word Balloon listeners, via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. If uh, you could subscribe to Word Balloon, it would really be greatly appreciated. Uh, it took a bit of a financial hit this year and could really use your help. If you enjoy the content I provide every week here at Word Balloon on audio and video, uh, you could really help me out by subscribing to Word Balloon for the price of a comic book. Can you spare five dollars a month can you spare even a dollar a month if you can if you think the content is worth your time it would be great patreon.com slash word balloon thank you league of word balloon listeners hey everybody welcome back to word balloon the comic book conversation show john suntress here today a great conversation with bob greenberger you might remember Bob is uh, one of the great writers and editors of DC Comics back in the 80s. Uh, he was involved with the special projects department, putting out some incredible trade paperbacks and uh, hardcovers. And uh, he's doing a couple great hardcovers now for DC. From Chartwell Books, two great DC histories, The Justice League's 100 Greatest Moments and DC Heroine's 100 Greatest Moments. These are great coffee table books that have a lot of information and also are a good concentration of comic book history going back to the golden age in the case of the DC heroines and uh, the Justice League going back to the beginnings of the Silver Age when they got started in Brave and Bold and went on to their own book and uh, it's dense it, it has a lot of great moments as it says a hundred great moments great chapters great looks at characters not only in the Justice League but also uh, adjacent characters that have guest starred, people like Adam Strange and the like, that never were officially Justice League members, but were important in various stories. All the great crossovers as well, not only with the Justice Society, but so many other parallel universe adventures with the Freedom Fighters and the Seven Soldiers of Victory and the like. Uh, great stories, and we discuss those with Bob. We also discuss the DC heroines and their great moments, uh, some that I had forgotten about, and uh, some that go back to the Golden Age. Uh, there were progressive writing uh, for, for women happening in the uh, Golden Age, and I think it's interesting that Bob was able to uncover those, and uh, it's a great conversation. Plus, Bob used to work for the Weekly World News. We discussed that. Uh, his time at DC, observations of other creators and editors that were at DC. Really great conversation. And of course, Bob is a diehard Star Trek fan. He wrote um, an unauthorized Star Trek history a couple years ago. That's the first time he was on Word Balloon. Had to get his opinions on Discovery. What's going on with uh, the J.J. Verse and the movie Star Trek IV? Is it going to happen at all? Is it going to happen without Chris Pine? Are we not going to have Captain Kirk in a Star Trek movie? Interesting times for the Star Trek franchise, and I wanted to get Bob's opinion of those. All that and a lot more in this conversation with Bob Greenberger on today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, as always, for your support via Patreon. Uh, greatly appreciated. We're at the beginning of the month. Word Balloon is free. It will always be free. But uh, do you like what I do here? Do you think the content that I try to provide each month at Word Balloon is worth the price of a comic? Is it worth a dollar a month? If you're interested and in you can do it, can you subscribe to Word Balloon via Patreon? You can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon. We'll go to the front page of wordballoon.com. Click on the Patreon ad. That will take you to my Patreon page. Thank you for your help, League of Word Balloon listeners. All right, without further ado, let's get into our conversation now with Bob Greenberger on Word Balloon. Bob Greenberger, welcome back to Word Balloon. We talked years ago about uh, your excellent Star Trek history book. What was the title of that book? Uh, Star Trek, The Complete Unauthorized History. Yes, indeed. Absolutely, man. And now you're back with uh, a series of authorized histories for DC. And uh, I'm, I'm staring at the two volumes that are out right now. And that's uh, The Justice League, 100 Greatest Moments. And then DC Comics Super Heroines, 100 Greatest Moments. Pretty cool, man. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, these are published through Chartwell Books, and uh, DC had recommended me to them. It uh, has been a, a tremendous amount of fun, you know, play, playing with my memories, you know. Well, and a third volume to come in the summer uh, hundred uh, for the greatest villains, uh, 100 Greatest Moments. 
Actually, I believe it's going to be uh, probably late spring in time for Father's Day gift giving. Very nice. Excellent, man. This is terrific. Um, these really are great ideas for Christmas. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I do want to talk about both because they are both incredible. Um, the Heroines book is the one that just came out. And what I love about it is, specifically, it's great to see that uh, you can really go back even during the 40s, the Golden Age, and get some really cool, impressive, you know, moments for heroines in the 40s. And I, I think, you know, sometimes we, you know, we just think of Lois Lane uh, tied to the, tra- you know, railroad tracks and in danger and stuff like that. And we don't think of uh, maybe uh, forward thinking on the writer's standpoint to uh, put the hero, you know, the, the women in a, in, a, in a lead role beyond, of course, the creation of Wonder Woman and people like that. Well, I it comes down to the creators who were involved at the time. And, and you've got some people like William Moulton Marston who were, you know, tremendous advocates for women. And then you just had writers who, you know, got tired of writing mystery men and said, you know, there are, there's a whole other gender we can play with. Uh, you know, and I have to give credit to guys like Will Eisner who helped give us not only Shana the she devil, but she the queen of the jungle. Forgive me. Wow. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of heroes and heroines in there, man. It's all right. Yeah, but you know, Will gave uh, gave uh, Sheena and uh, Phantom Lady. Uh, yes. yes. You know, so he he definitely helped contribute to to giving us a, a bunch of superheroines. But as I cover in the introduction, uh, some of the first graphic heroines, you know, even date back to the pulp magazines. You know, Olga, the woman with the X-ray eyes. This is true. Very cool, man. Well, I, there was one story in particular that I'm glad you covered. And I remember them rewriting and t- retelling the story either in the 90s or in the 2000s. But there was a just, Justice Society story where all the male heroes get captured and Wonder Woman gathers all of their significant others to kind of get together and, and be a Justice Society to attack uh, the villain and everything. And, I mean, it's not just Hawk, Hawk Girl. But it is De- uh, Diane Belmont for the Sandman, and yeah. uh, and I forget uh, the woman that was uh, with the Spectre at the time. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, it's great, man. All these great and and Starman's girlfriend, all of these great Justice Society, you know, women that <laughs> they put the costumes on and they go to fight the bad guy. Yeah, um, uh, James Robinson retold that story in the pages of his Starman run, so that's the 1990s. And there you go. And I remember, I must have read the All Star story uh at some point during my uh time at dc and then james retold that story and of course the art is you know a a lot better for uh you know contemporary readers but you know there was a certain charm to what gardner did you know uh, gender swapping like that and and it was a nice bit of uh variety gardner fox absolutely man what i like too is for both books you went to the fans and asked them to kind of help compile these lists am i right well, yes. I mean, I've been reading comics since I was six years old, so that goes back 54 years. And while I read and loved all of this material, I'm just one guy. And it occurred to me, if I'm going to do the 100 Greatest Moments, there's going to be some reader out there who's going to go, well, what does he know? Or who is he to tell me these are the 100 Greatest Moments? So I definitely turned to the community. Uh, for the Justice League book, uh, I definitely... Uh, played on my connections with a lot of the guys who worked on the books. And so I got a lot of contributions uh, from people like um, you know, Jerry Conway, Steve Englehart, Marv Wolfman, uh, Mark Wade, uh, you know, all chipped in with ideas. And then I went to Facebook and I, I found a number of the various DC related face group book groups and said, Hey guys, I'm doing these books. What it what what's on your mind? And in some ways, it validated my thinking and reminded me of a couple of things I had forgotten about. I bet, I bet, man. Yeah, it's uh no, it's a good it's a good list of other uh, writers slash historians that I think have always shown their affection for the characters over the decades. And uh, man, it, it was great because there were. I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a few years younger than you, and I'll you know just like you've been reading comics since you know five or six. And um, again, it was interesting to see a bunch of old stories that I had forgotten about or hadn't even read. And uh, again, in both books, man, um, especially like there's some real surprises. Again, when you see the superheroine book, 
um, and um, you don't you don't necessarily think of some characters like Wonder Woman's uh, mother, uh, Hippolyta, has some great heroic moments. And I remember, well, I, well, I remembered her death from Our Worlds at War. I, um, I think it was John Wells, um, who has always been my backstop on, on so much of this historic work. Um, John reminded me that Hippolyta portrayed Wonder Woman back in the Golden Age, and I said, I got to use that. Yeah, that's insane. Yes great story and it's it's in the book well and then i forgot that uh you know even in the modern era like they they kind of retconned hippolyta taking uh wonder woman's place for the earth Two justice society stories. i mean yeah that was that was john Dur- trying to make the continuity palatable yeah yeah and that was fine but yeah like you said this golden age story and then also and i'm looking it up was it in, a, in I'm forgetting Phil's last name who wrote that wonderful run of Wonder Woman in the 2000s? Phil Jimenez. Of course it was Phil Jimenez. Shame on me. I, I was thinking of Phil Winslade for some reason, but yeah, of course it's Phil Jimenez. Oh my yeah, God. Phil Winslade's done much writing. Yeah, of course not. But yes, Phil Jimenez during his run on Wonder Woman, oh my God, there's, and I don't even want to spoil it, tremendous, like, really dramatic moment. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know. he definitely um, played along a lot of that mother-daughter dynamic, uh, especially building up to our worlds at war. So it played out very nicely. There you go, man. No, great stuff. And, uh, that you know, that's the thing. And, I mean, you know, Vixen is in here. Of course, Harley Quinn is in there. Um, I'm leaning on the, well, on the, on the heroine one because, um, you know, the, the Justice League, you can speak for itself. Of course, the team has been amazing, and we, we'll talk about that in a second. But there are some really great surprises in the heroine's book that I really well, wanted to Well, you know, the interesting on. thing for the heroine's book is I had a whole number, a list of other heroines uh, who wound up getting squeezed out when uh, I was asked to – Look at the heroic moments that the traditional villains of Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn uh, had made and had to make room for them. So people like Black Orchid suddenly, you know, missed out. Oh, wow. Uh, Amazing. And I I understand. You know, this is we're in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame season. And I bet, you know, I, I have a feeling you might feel the same way. Sometimes you look at the list and it's like, all right, there's the popularity contest. And, of course, Stevie Nicks is going to get in. Oh, she's already in for Fleetwood Mac. But it's like, yeah, of course. Janet Jackson, yeah, of course. But, you know, on the on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing, I'm like, you know, I would really like them to be smart and put MC5 and John Prine and some of these names that younger rock fans might be like, who? What? Who are these people? And it's like, yeah, you might have forgotten them, but they really had significant moments and deserve their, their place. And that's why, wow, it's amazing. Like, yeah, Black Orchid, what a fascinating character. That sucks that she didn't make the cut. She's, uh, she's amazing. Who are some of the others that didn't, unfortunately, make the cut? Uh, it's always interesting to hear that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I could call up the list, but, uh, you know, there's definitely at least one or two other uh, Legionnaires and uh, their oh, moments. Sure. And I definitely wanted to do something with um, Lilith uh, from the Teen Titans, uh, and she got squeezed. Sure. sure. You know. Um, no, those. Are, that's a good also rant. <laughs> Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Uh, okay, sure. All there from her Young Justice appearances. You know, people like that. Even the Secret. I think I had a moment in, in one of my earlier uh, lists, and. As we were weighing back and forth, and you know, I was being asked for uh, a couple more moments for some of the other players. So, you know, I did what I could. I understand, man. But the you know, meanwhile, Amanda Waller is in there. Uh, Amethyst is in there. Princess Projectra is in there. Certainly, Saturn Girl, as we mentioned, Legionnaires. Uh, well, the thing about Projectra, interestingly enough, yeah, you know, I, I she was there. Largely because she did the heroic thing and and abandoned the Legion to rule her planet, and then ruled and executed the man who uh, you know killed her husband. Uh, you know that's cold. Yeah, <laughs> that's that that's the law. And uh, then she did the whole you know mystery thing as Sensor Girl in uh, in uh, Paul Levitz's run with yes. With Greg LaRocque, and I just like I couldn't miss that one because that was such a great mystery. Everyone thought it was a resurrected Supergirl or something. Yep. I remember it well, and man, that Levitt's Legion run, unbelievable stuff. Yeah, man. And yes, yeah, Sensor Girl, yeah, that was such a big, significant story. No, I don't blame you at all. I mean, that's the thing. There are no, there's, there's really, really great stuff in here. 
um, as far as uh, the various women. And yeah, I mean, you're going to go, uh, you know, older readers can go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And I think younger readers will be happy, too, because really every decade is well represented, I think, in your list. Well, that's one of the discussions I had with uh, DC and Chartwell was that the book Justice League covered 60 years because that's how long the team has been around. Mm -hmm. But Super Heroines covers 80 years of publishing. And when DC acquired Charlton and uh, Fawcett I, I, and Quality, you know, I, I had to you know, pay homage to, to the significant players there. Um, as great as the Justice League book is, I think visually the Super Heroines book is a richer book because I have so many more uh, sources to pull from. Understood. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the acquisitions that DC made over the years because, yeah, Mary Marvel is in there, Nightshade re representing um, the Charlton uh, characters and stuff. Right. And, uh, and yeah. Phantom Lady. I mean, unfortunately, course, we don't have any uh, good digital files from the, the, for the old Golden Age run, so I had to go with uh, one of her appearances from, again, James Robinson Starman. It's like I, I had to go where the material was. I understand. Yeah, that's interesting that uh, they don't have uh, good digital files because, man, all those beautiful Matt Baker covers of Phantom Lady over the years. And, right. You know, man. they wanted to go for the, the strongest reproduction possible because at one point I said, well, this stuff doesn't exist, so let's do high-res scans of the comic pages. And they, they did not uh, want to go that, down that road. So, you know, DC didn't start collecting their film until the early 50s. So you you got a tremendous amount of material that's been recovered uh, through digital means since then. But you know, quality faucet, you know, even timely slash Atlas slash Marvel did not save their film in, until decades later. That's interesting. And yeah, I, as I understood it, and uh, tell me because I think I think Marty Pasco told me this that uh, that's when we started getting like the 80 page uh giants and stuff like that and that uh that that all came from uh back in the day you know uh doing uh stats of the older books and that's when they started putting them putting them out am i right pretty much i mean the, the film library started probably in the early 50s and by and we had the first 80 page giant by 60 61 so it took a couple of years to start building up the inventory pretty crazy man well that's you know that's where my love of comic history came from was from the 80 page giants and certainly the hundred page spectaculars in the, in the seventies. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I was able to get those, uh, those sixties reprints pretty cheap back, back in the day and stuff, but yeah, you know, and then, and then when, uh, I think the publisher was called Bonanza back in the seventies when they did, uh, the, uh, Superman Shazam and Batman from the thirties to the seventies collections. And those had yeah, old stories in them. Um, Pretty certain those were imprints of Random House at the time, or okay. pretty certain. Anyway, yeah, no, the Batman from the 30s to the 70s and Superman from the 30s to the 70s were like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and in a lot of ways, when DC started doing things like uh, the greatest stories ever told uh, collections in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, we turned to what Eddie Nelson Bridwell compiled in those two books as, as our you know uh, North Star. I understand. Well, and you you played a big role in that stuff, weren't you? Editing a lot of those collections. Uh, Mike Gold uh, conceived of the series and then worked with me and Brian Augustin on uh, all of those greatest stories. So yeah, I mean, he ever saw it. Uh, we had a lot of uh, we did a lot of the groundwork and brainstorming together, and then like you know, I did Batman and Brian did Joker, and you know, I I went on to. Um, whatever came ne uh, next while well, Brian worked on the greatest uh, stories of the 50s and that sort of stuff. Okay. That's so funny. I literally just talked to uh, Brian two days ago, and his episode and your episode are probably going to drop around the same time. And also, I, Mike, uh, Mike Holt's going to be coming back to Chicago, so we've got, a, we've got an unofficial planned dinner uh, while he's in town. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have to talk to him about that and also talk to Brian about that the next time I, I speak to him. I was leaning mostly yeah. on, uh, he's, you know, of course, you know, Brian, Brian's doing uh, Archie 1941. But yes, also, also we, uh, we talked about, of course, Gotham by Gaslight. And, uh, yeah, you can't talk to Brian without that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember when Mike said we're going to do this um, 
greatest Superman stories ever told. And we're going to go out, he and I were going to go up to John Byrne's house and spend the day there brainstorming what to include because John had just started on Superman at the time. So that was kind of an interesting afternoon to get John's perspective because he had re- reread so much of this material to figure out what to keep and what to toss. Okay. And was, so, you know, that made for a lot of interesting give and take. Um, yeah, I was wondering, was you know, yeah, what kind of arguments about, like, you know, uh, things that were, you know, classic Superman that obviously he jettisoned to. And it's OK. I mean, the Man of Steel run is and, and I just call it that representing all the burn uh, work and everything. It was it was great for its time. I'm glad that in in retrospect uh, or I should say since then, uh, you know, other other Superman editors and the people that have decided where the story is going to go in the in the future brought back things like Candor, brought back, you know, other little aspects, certainly bringing back Supergirl, you know, things like that. It's it's interesting. And, and of course, that's the great thing about these characters. They're f- uh, flexible enough. They're flexible enough, but it also speaks to the readership. Uh, if you think about it, so much of what we keep bringing back is what more – Weisinger added in the late 50s when the shackles were taken off him after the uh, TV show was canceled. So he could go and, and, and do whatever he wanted and not have to make the comics totally resemble the TV show. Was that an edict? I mean, to because obviously you're right, during that period, they really were urban Superman stories, Daily Planet, really Superman dealing with non-superpowered uh, villains and yeah, pretty much just gangsters and 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 like you say, uh, resembling the TV show. That really was a strong edict to keep it all uh, you know uniform and and uh, similar. Well, Whitney Ellsworth was DC's guy in Hollywood, and he was so integral to the TV show, and he was still being listed as the I think it was the editorial director uh, for the comics at the time. So yeah, I mean there was a lot of back and forth, and and they were very conscious, especially you know. Remember that the TV show was also at the same time you had the Comic Code hearings, uh, you know the uh, Kafalder hearings that led to the birth of the Comics Code, and, and the comics had to be squeaky clean. Understood. Yeah, I guess so. And I mean, some great things came from uh, the TV show into the comics as well. The Lois Lane book, the Jimmy Olsen book. Yeah, nobody. You know, you got to give more than a lot of credit for being saying. You know, they had the name recognition. And you could expand the brand that way. Uh, it, was, it was, you know. Kind of an interesting experiment to try it out, and boy, did that work. Unbelievable stuff, yeah, man. And even into uh, the Superman family when they canceled the monthlies and folded them into uh, the the big anthology and stuff. You know, right. I, I was a huge fan of uh, Superman family. And, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Superman, uh, the further adventures of the Earth 2 Superman being married to Lois. And you got that great uh, Kurt, Kurt Schaffenberger uh, uh, um, art and everything. Am I saying his name right? Yes, Kurt. Yeah, uh, Kurt was such a gentleman, and he definitely could give you that golden age feel and make Earth Two feel separate. And uh, you know, n- that was putting Nelson in a sandbox and say, "Here, have fun." Oh, he wrote it. Nelson. Nelson wrote Redwell it. wrote a lot of that Mr. and Mrs. Superman stuff. I think, he, if not all of it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you know, tell me about that period, man, because you really got to meet a lot of those great uh, golden and silver age creators uh, while they were still working and, and producing great stuff for DC. You know, I got to D.C. in January 1984, so steadily working for the company at the time were, were the greats like, you know, Gil Kane and, yeah. you know, um, Jack uh, was Jack Abel? You know, being enticed to come back and finish Hunger Dog, uh, you know, the oh, Kirby. Uh, sure. Wow. You know, the New God stuff uh, and uh, re- basically revived the fourth world for the Kenner toys. You know, D.C. did right by Jack in that by bringing him in to do these character designs for Kenner, they were able to um, grant him uh, some creator equity in these characters even though they predated 1976 which was um, the copyright law changeover um, which allowed DC to uh, do profit sharing so you know they brought Jack in to do this stuff so they they could uh, cut him in on the deal and you know that that paid handsomely for him in his later years yeah, that's so amazing. Anyway, yeah, it go on. was, you know, Schaffenberger was still doing some stuff, and, uh, you know, Carmine was still get, working on stuff. And when Len Wein and I started brainstorming artists for, for Who's Who, 
you know, there were still some guys out in the periphery who weren't doing a lot of stuff month in and month out. But, like, you know, I could call George Tusca and get some pages. Awesome. And, I, and Bernie Sachs came in one day to um, have lunch with Julie Schwartz and said, you know, I still ink. And I started throwing who's who pages at him. And then suddenly I'm working with a guy whose stuff I grew up on who hadn't been in, in the business in over a decade. That's fantastic. Kurt you know, Swan? So, Any Kurt Swan stories? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Kurt, Kurt was rarely came into the offices, never lingered long, but always had a good word for people. And he always was friendly and a real gentleman. And uh, I'm sorry I never really got to know him that well. Uh, got to know, uh, like Don Heck, who was finishing his Wonder Woman at the time. Um, he was great. He was a sweetheart. He'd take the train in from Long Island and he'd come hang out at the offices. But it was also a time of change. And when I got to the role of um, editorial coordinator in the late 80s, I'm suddenly saying to guys like Don, tastes have changed. And, and there's no – I'm finding it hard to find work for you. And, and it's just the nature of the beast. He totally understood it. He was a gentleman about it. So was some of these other guys. But you could see the pain in their eyes. They knew it was coming. They see, saw what happened to the people who preceded them, and it was just painful on me because these are guys I grew up on. Wow. You know? Um, yeah. You know, Superman, you know, Kirk comes off Superman, and we're giving him stuff like toy tie-ins with masks, and it's like, it just was painful. I understand, man. No, and I remember that time seeing Kurt's name on uh, the toy tie-ins and stuff. Yeah, pretty rough, man. No, I understand, and what well, like you it, say? But, you know, I'm... I'm you know, getting getting work out of these guys: Jack Kirby, Gil Kane, Kurt Schaffenberger, Kurt Swan, George Tuska, Nick Carty. You know, just like wow, here we're in heaven. That's cool. No, I understand, man. Well, I want to go back to the Justice League book for a second because sure. uh, there's there's great stuff in here. Um, you, I mean, really, the way you break down. I'm looking at the table of contents right now. Uh, I mean, there's just great detail in here. You know, you've got you've got chapters on. Uh, the various uh, JLA headquarters. Um, certainly, uh, one of my favorite things is the various um, the other heroes that teamed up with the Justice League over the years. And there were always those great uh, events uh, involving the parallel worlds where they met the Freedom Fighters, the quality heroes of of the '40s. And uh, in fact, I know that there's a new Freedom Fighters book in the works. I've seen some preview pages already. Uncle oh, how's Sam. it look? Looks well. It looks great. I hope. Uh, I don't know, man. There's always something missing when they try to reboot some of these things, and uh, I, I hope that uh, they get it right with this one. And I can't remember who the writer is, but I know I've seen Uncle Sam uh, already getting started, and I know Human Bomb and Phantom Lady are going to be part of the team. Um, but uh, God, the Seven Soldiers of Victory, a totally forgotten team. And also the way it was represented in the early 70s. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. When Len comes on to, to write the Justice League, he comes on with number 100. And, and it was his idea to to do something huge and bring in the seven soldiers. And at that point, he, you know, he and Julie were breaking down the story. And they realized, given the page counts at the time, there was no way it could fit two issues. So that was, you know, it went three issues, which was a big deal back then. <laughs> Absolutely, man. No, exactly. It was in the done in one. Very rarely you might get a two parter and stuff. So you had to do three parts. Well, and they had been doing these. I mean, it started with Gardner Fox. These great ideas of let's bring back the the heroes of the forties. And you had the Crisis on Earth one, Crisis on Earth two with the Justice Society. And then it just seemed every year like, all right, you know, we gotta we gotta outdo what we did last year. Where do we go? So you're right. You bring in a guy like Len. And all of a sudden, you get you know Seven Soldiers of Victory and the Freedom Fighters, and um, God, my one of my favorites, and I'm glad it's acknowledged in the book as well. When writers, uh, the DC writers of the '70s, Elliot S. Magan and Carrie Bates, actually are in the story <laughs> and working with the Justice League, I remember that story, and just the idea of Earth Prime and that it was the real world suddenly had a, another parallel Earth. That uh, you know the the DC heroes were visiting, and the idea that <laughs> Julie. Well, Schwartz- you know, once once Julie opened the door to our world being connected to the multiverse in um, Flash One Seventy Nine Flash Factor Fiction, you knew they'd go back to it. 
That was the great thing. Yeah, man. And, and, you see, now I missed I missed that initial flash story, but I just loved the idea that there was a cosmic treadmill in Julie Schwartz's closet. <laughs> what was funny is back then, I, I don't think he had a closet at the 909 3rd Avenue where the offices were at the time. I that was an invention of the story. That's hilarious. I've talked to Elliot about that story that they're in in the Justice League. I haven't had Kerry yet on. I really want to talk to Kerry Bates eventually. I mean, my God, what a great writer. I'm such a fan of his. You know, he he's a, he was terrific on Superman. And he's got such a great origin story by by actually designing covers that Mort bought uh, to write stories around. Wow. I had no idea. That's amazing. A couple yeah, years. so, you know, well, Jim Shooter is is recognized, you know, for being this 13-year-old kid writing comics back in 1966. It was about a year or so later, Bates is, you know, right behind them. Wow. I didn't realize that. That's amazing. I didn't know he was that young. When he started, what a great flash run. And uh, I mean, I'm glad that that's always acknowledged. And I know talking to a guy like Jeff Johns, he loved Carrie Bates uh, flash run in particular. And it was really cool. A couple of years ago, there was a, a, a Superman story that was kind of an Elseworlds. It was a basically what if Jor-El had uh, created a rocket ship big enough to take himself, Lara and Cal to sure. to Earth. And then uh, they had a second son or a daughter. I can't remember which. But it was a tremendous story of all the elves being on Earth and how history might have unfolded with the entire family being there. And it was an incredible story. And, and they put it in regular comic book form. I don't know if they ever traded. I don't think they ever did uh, collect it as a trade. But that was I recall. So, what's that? I said not that I recall. Yeah. And it was such a shame because it was such a great story. And um, – you know, it was just great to see that, hey, Kerry Bates can still hit it out of the park if you put him in the, you know, put him in the batter's box. You know, he still has great stories in him and stuff. And it was, oh, it was just fantastic. So I don't know. Um, but anyway, back to the back to the book. No, you really um, I mean, you've got you've got great battles that are acknowledged here. And of course, uh, their greatest enemies. Um, it's 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 great, man. It's it, it's very comprehensive. And I, well, and I th- thank you. Uh, you know, when I was conceiving what to do with it, uh, when they gave me this idea back in July of 2017, uh, I did the initial breakdown based along these lines, largely because I didn't want to, you know, is one punch with Guy Gardner, you know, a, a singular moment, and how does it work in context? <laughs> You know, to me, context is everything. Explaining this stuff, especially when the continuity changes, and you know, why Superman in the electric blue costume all of a sudden, and why is yes. there this younger, darker-skinned Green Arrow? Uh, yes. So I needed to trace the history, and it just made sense to break it down this way, so you could understand. Well, they had multiple headquarters, and the great things happened in each of them. Absolutely, they did. Well, and again, even that initial thing when they formed the team and the Superman and Batman editors were kind of jerky and like, no, you can't use them. Well, you know, the thing is, is that as Julie always described it to us uh, youngsters when we got to D.C., it was really a collection of fiefdoms. Um, Everybody had their line of books. Everybody had their roster of talent. Never the twain shall meet. Uh, And they were very proprietary. And Mort said, I got six or seven Superman titles. He put them in an eighth book. uh, It's going to hurt my sales. He had no way to say that. He was just, you know, being protective. And Jack Schiff with the same on Batman until finally um, uh, uh, Donenfeld, uh, Henry Donenfeld. Oh, okay. uh, You know, the son of of the co-founder of the company. Sorry, it's Irwin Donenfeld, the son of the... uh, co-founder of the company uh basically said there are characters tell them to go you know <laughs> go to hell to put them in the book <laughs> was was julie the first uh, justice league editor yes uh when it was clear that showcase as a tryout book uh was very successful uh they turned brave and bold into a tryout book and by then Julie had successfully reintroduced Flash and Green Lantern. And at that point, they had enough heroes to retry the Justice Society. So they decided to try um, using Brave and Bold as the tryout for the Justice League there. So that was Julie's. And when the book uh, succeeded, boom, um, you know, Julie, Julie and Gardner Fox, you know, just kept running with it. The one thing Julie – to Anytime it came up, Julie could never remember why they left Green Arrow out of the initial lineup. 
Um, because he wasn't reading everybody else's books, neither was Gardner. Everyone thinks it's, they just forgot him. <laughs> but it, may, it gave a great story to add the first member to the roster. So, you know, it worked in the end. I think I remember reading that first Green Arrow story in a Treasury Edition Justice League collection. Wouldn't be I, surprised. Yeah, I think that I think that was the case. But uh, oh my god! So, do you have a favorite uh, other than the the big three? Do you have a favorite uh, Justice League member? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> a favorite Justice League member? Uh, I gotta say, I, I definitely. Uh, appreciated when Engelhart finally added Hawkwoman. Haw- well, she was still Hawk Girl um, sure, to the sure. book uh, because she always seemed overlooked. And they had still, you know, they kept making up things like, "Oh, our roster is locked at twelve. It was like by whom? <laughs> you know, um, you know. It, it it was later when the United Nations had some say over the Justice League, but back then they were just a collection of guys having a club. Rewrite sure. the rules. Well, that, tell that to the X-Men. Tell that to the Legion of Superheroes, that there's only 12. That's fantastic. Well, you know, the Legion had their own silly rules, like, you know, you, you know, only one member with the, with the same power, so lightning lasts, you have to leave now. <laughs> I, that's right. I forgot about that. And then her powers changed, and she became light last. And she, right, uh, she, which, she could which manipulate. Was, clearly, they, they had an affection for her uh, <laughs> and decided to kind of come up with an interesting way to keep her around until they made gave her powers back. So, you know. Hilarious. Well, that and I always love that uh, that quirk about uh, the Legion that you can only be the leader for one year. And that was great because then it did kind of switch up the stories a little bit. And so and every now and then, not only Sad and Girl, but Projector was uh, led the Legion for a while. And you did have women leading the Legion for a while. Well, that, you know, that was that was a good move on Murray Boltonoff's part when he became aware of Legion fandom, which was started by Mike Flynn and Harry Brogis uh, through the fanzines. They, uh, Murray started the contest to vote in for the Legion leader. That's right. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned Legion fandom because I always say, especially when I grew up in the 70s, and who knows what it was like prior to that, but it was like you were either a Legion of Superheroes fan or an X Men fan. And for whatever reasons, I think because of Mike Grell's art, I became a Legion fan. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I have a lot of respect for the X-Men. It just doesn't speak to me. And, um, and I, I forget how big Legion fandom was back in the 60s and 70s and how that they had that interaction with the writers. And like you say, Murray Boltonoff, who I immediately always think of with uh, Brave and Bold uh, first – and forget right. about his association with the Legion and stuff. And yet, you know, there's a guy that, that I think slips through the cracks sometimes when they talk about significant people at, at D.C. And, I mean, those, in addition to what he did for the Legion, those brave and bold stories that he and Bob Haney were, you know, presiding over, where it was just like, yeah, we don't care that it doesn't make sense to you that Sergeant Rock and Batman are doing a story together. We're doing it. And they were great stories. And I mean, yes, I'm sure from a continuity standpoint, it drove everybody nuts. But it was like, no, these are fun. Or just the fact that Wildcat and Batman were just hanging out with no explanation of, Mm -hmm. oh, Wildcat's here from Earth 2 or whatever. They were just great stories. When I got to D.C. in the 80s, um, Murray was still coming in a couple days a week. Uh, He was reduced down to pretty much Sergeant Rock and G.I. Combat and... Then Kubert uh, was pretty much packaging rocks, so he just had GI combat. And he was nearing retirement, but he would attend the meetings. He would continue to come up with ideas and pitch. I, he was definitely a team player right to the end. Uh, and Paul made us – reminded all of us who were not there um, earlier that as much as artistically and creatively we might have preferred – Joe Orlando's House of Mystery and House of Secrets because it gave rise to a whole generation of writers and artists. Murray's ghosts can, and witching hour always outsold them. Interesting. Murray had a very commercial uh, sense, and that commercial ability, which is where he made Brave and Bold really successful, and he kept Teen Titans really interesting through the 60s, even though you might wince at some of the, the Bob Haney uh, slang. It's sold. I'm not surprised, man. Yeah, and, that's and great. Therefore, 
from a commercial standpoint, Murray was one of DC's best editors. Interesting. That's great, man. Well, you know, and I and it's funny because as I've gotten older, I've uh, looked for when I'm going through the dollar bins, what used to be the quarter bins, uh, I'm always looking for the DC War books and the DC Westerns, and those are the things that I'm uh, I'm most interested in now that I wasn't interested in when I was a little kid. And now it's like, oh, let me see who the artists were. Let me see who the writers were. And especially those, you know, eight-page stories and six-page stories. It's like, yeah, let me let me see those. I mean, those are tough to do. And, they were you know, tough to do, and yet that's how people made their living for, until book, like, uh, books became the norm in the night, you know, late sixties, early seventies. Understood. No, it's it's. I find it fascinating, and man, just uh, all the great um, Filipino artists that did so much work for the mystery books and the war books and everything, and and the West. That was a brilliant addition, and it was done to save money. I, you know, I unfortunately, crassly, I've I've come to learn that because obviously, yeah, the Filipino economy, uh, you know, was was smaller and stuff, and so you could get away with you know spending less money. And these guys were incredible artists, Sakala and. Uh, Oh my God! You know, I'm, I'm looking at one of my Tony De Zuniga's that I have a Jonah Hex that he did for me uh, about ten years ago. Just unbelievable stuff. A great, a great Jonah Hex sketch and stuff. Just beautiful work. Well, I have to say, as you know, Tony was great and Alfredo, the sweetheart and a very talented artist. But because his body of work was more limited, and because he died far younger, um, Nestor Redondo is still. To me, one of the all-time great comic book artists. I hear you, man. I'm not I mean, in my head. When yeah. Beam of the Jungle Girl debuted in the mid '70s, I guess you had not seen stuff that gorgeous. And then when he when he succeeded Bernie Wrightson on Swamp Thing, it was not as uh, horrific and supernatural, but God, it was gorgeous. And then when he did the Bible, I mean, you know, this, this was a guy you know, right up there with Jose Luis Garcia Lopez who could just draw. Yep. May not, not be, a... may not be, you know, in your face like Kirby and Buscema, but God, he could draw. I'm with you, man. I forgot he had done the uh, the Treasury Edition version of the Bible that DC did. Yeah, man, that's that's amazing. You see, this is why, and I'm glad we're going into these areas of DC because it just shows. Uh, the the breadth of knowledge that you have when it comes to these characters, and that people will find in both collections, the Justice League collection and the uh, the DC Heroines collection. I mean, it's your kind, uh, it's, it, dude. Your the your work speaks for itself. And again, it's this kind of observational stuff that I find interesting. I liked it when uh, we talked about the Star Trek book years ago. All right, let's take a break from Bob and uh, talk a bit about our sponsor today, Aftershock Comics. Now, you know these books. I'm sure you've seen them on your racks at uh, your favorite comic shop. A whole slew of fresh, high-concepts titles that are written and drawn by your favorite creators. Things like Jimmy's Bastards, the spy series from Garth Ennis and Ross Brown. Pestilence from Frank Thierry and Oleg Okunev, where the 14th century Black Plague from history is actually revealed to be the first zombie outbreak. Or the Brothers Jack Cool, the early years of Vlad the Impaler from Cullen Bunn and Mirko Kolak. Now, these creators came to Aftershock to tell their stories with no rules and no forced continuity, just a great new platform to tell interesting stories. You should check them out. Great new titles. Hot Lunch Special from Elliot Royale and Jorge Fornes. Conspiracy theories that are tied from centuries past to the modern day with Beyonders by Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair. And Monstro Mechanica, which is a great kind of steampunk story featuring Leonardo da Vinci, his female apprentice Isabel, and their wooden robot. It's from Paul Aller and Chris Evenweiss. The collected trade is out, and it is fantastic. Uh, we'll be talking to more Aftershock creators in the days and weeks ahead and uh, give you more information on some of their great books, but you don't have to wait. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, let's get back to our conversation now with Bob Greenberger on Word Balloon. I got to ask you about Star Trek because sure. it's back. And have you have you watched Discovery? I've seen the first season. Uh, the first of the um, the short treks have debuted, and I haven't seen that yet. And I know as much as you do about the second season. Uh, so I I liked a lot of what I saw for Discovery. Um, I think if I were involved, I would have said I think it was too early to go to the mirror universe. 
because I think we need to establish what our characters are before we see their mirror opposites. Uh, but that having said that, I thought it looked good. I thought they had some strong performances. It was nice to see a diverse cast, both um, use of uh, people of color as well as you know alien races. Sure. So there, there was a lot to like, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what they do when Christopher Pike walks on board. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm I am excited for the second season. I didn't like it. It's well, I didn't like it as much as it sounds like you liked it. There were I I felt that there was like you said the mirror universe. I just felt that the writing really was kind of uh, subpar, for, especially for Star Trek. And also, um, I'm looking forward to. Um, a, a legitimate reason why Michael Burnham needs to be Spock's sister. And I mean, it's okay that she would have been raised by Vulcans. I, I much like you said about the mirror universe. I just feel like star Trek, this it's such a big universe and, and it would have been interesting to see her raised by a different Vulcan than Sarek and maybe, and, and not to, uh, by all means include Sarek in the story, but it's, it's almost, I keep making the analogy. It's almost like saying Martin Luther King was the only civil rights advocate of the sixties. And it would be interesting to see another, another Vulcan, uh, raising a human and having a, a a different opinion of humans. And frankly, I felt like the characterization of Sarek was not, uh, consistent with what we've got in the past. Sarek to me, while he loved humans and obviously married a human. And as a star Trek expert, I'd like your opinion on this. Uh, but I just feel like, or a fan, a fan expert. I, I just, yeah, I just felt he was too warm and resembled, Spock after V'ger and Spock in the movies after he was comfortable with himself. And to me, Sarek was much more strident. And while he, again, respected humans and loved a human, I, I just didn't buy his almost like playful relationship with Michael. Yep, I could see that. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, the severity of Mark Leonard's performance in both um, Journey to Babel and then Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Um, this is a man very set in his ways and very set in his attitudes. And and the conflict between him and Spock uh, in Journey to Babel is just so strongly delineated that I don't think James Frain uh, sold it in the same way. And I think the writing may have um, not served him well. Yeah, again, I, and that's the thing. I really think it does come down to the writing. I think all the actors did great with what they were given to work with or even uh, another Mark Leonard moment for me was um, in uh, Star Trek 4 The Voyage Home when he has that conversation uh, with uh, or yeah it was 4 where yeah he, t- he talks to Sarek and he's like you know uh, you know I maybe I was wrong about you know Starfleet and your your uh, your other crew members they're of good character and Spock's like yeah they're my friends and it's like, uh, yes, of course. And, and just his, again, his response, yes, of course. Like, that's another human kind of BS thing. And I love that. That's like, well, that's Sterek. Like you say, there's that consistency. So, and again, I just think it would have been interesting t- to have a different Vulcan. To- no question. No question yeah. in my mind. Dramatically, that would be a really interesting thing, uh, way to stir the pot. Because we have Sovol and his attitude as the... Uh, leader of the Vulcans during the Enterprise era, and we have Sarek. So, yeah, I mean, those are the two main Vulcans you have with their attitudes toward humans and interacting with them. So, yeah, a third perspective could have been very interesting. Well, and by the same token, let's see if they do it or not. And I think there are other fans that are saying the same thing. It's like, hey, you want to impress us? All right, fine. There's Burnham, there's Spock. Let's make Cybok matter. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a goofy little kink of Star Trek V that everyone's like, all right, whatever. No disrespect to Lawrence Luckinville, a fine actor who had to, you know, do the role and everything. But it's like, yeah, you want to impress me now? Fine, let's see that dinner table of Sarek, Michael, Cybok, uh, and uh, and Spock all sitting together, and of course Amanda. Oh, I, like, I wholeheartedly concur that if you're, you know, if you treat the fifth feature film as canon, as part of the Star Trek continuity, then by all means. You can't hide Cybok, especially when you're dealing with these family issues. So I, I would have tremendous respect for the writing room uh, if they even work in a mention of him. It's going to be interesting moving forward. The showrunners are new now. Um, also, uh, I think with, uh, frankly, 
uh, and now I'm blanking on his name, the uh, CEO of uh, of CBS that just got uh, ousted. Um, mm. who was not a, yes, Les Moonves, who was not a Star Trek fan, as I've learned uh, talking to people on the sly. And that apparently there's, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a story going around that when the J.J. movies were doing well or whenever they split Viacom and CBS became the IP holder for Star Trek, people went to Les Moonves and said, you know, we can do a series, a Star Trek series. We should consider it. And his response was Star Trek. That's the one with Darth Vader, right? And I, he, don't, he really I, I honestly don't believe that because uh, he's a smart man. Well, he's a smart man. Well, you could be a smart man, but not be interested in sci-fi or whatever. I don't know, man. I don't. And yeah. again, you're right. Television. You're right. I, uh, I, I, I would need to see that if I authenticated somewhere before I believe it. <laughs> but, but I, I will say this: the, the, the split into Viacom and CBS, or, or CBS Viacom and, and Paramount, um, was a dumb idea, which is one reason why seeing them try to reunite now makes me laugh because think of all the, the time and money and, and grief uh, everyone went through yeah. uh, for naught. And I think Star Trek suffered for it. I think um, benign neglect um, hurt Star Trek, which is they never should have allowed four years between the first and second Star Trek feature films. And then somebody should have went to Bad Robot uh, when they wrote the script to Into Darkness and said, this. I waited four years for this. I agree. <laughs> you could have turned to any three or four Star Trek novelists or comic book writers who could have come up with stronger stories. I cannot believe um, Orsi and Chrisman going, we could have come up with a story. It was like, then you weren't thinking hard enough. Yeah. Totally, man. Did you like Beyond? Did you like the third movie? I like Beyond a lot. Uh, my biggest problem was that it was a human turned into the alien monster and all. I, I really thought it would have been interesting to have an entirely alien perspective who saw the Federation from a different ideology. And it wasn't a revenge story against humans. Well, and I also thought, what a waste to have a guy like Idris Elba, who's such a great actor, all covered in all that latex, too. And then finally you get him in like the last five minutes looking like Idris Elba. It's like, hey, man, you got Idris Elba, for Christ's sake. What are you doing with him? That and um, – You know ahead. what? You, you could have put him in the latex and give him a, a better part. That's true, too. Seriously, That's I mean, the, the, the latex <laughs> is the least of it because he's still acting. He's still playing a character. They just didn't give him an interesting character. That's true. What do you think of – the prospect of possibly making a fourth movie without Chris Pine. I think it's interesting. I kind of, at first I'm like, well, they got to make a deal. Come on. You, how can you do Star Trek with Captain Kirk? But then I'm like, well, that would be kind of interesting because there have been some tremendous stories where, you know, the Tholian web, of course, where I think that's a great moment for, for Spock in, in leadership and everything. And, and right. same with the Galileo seven, but yeah, well, I'm like, Oh, it would be interesting with this group. To see a Zachary Quinto Spock suddenly have to lead the Enterprise. It's an interesting prospect. I don't know if they would go that way because in I gather Paramount's minds, um, the classic Star Trek is James D. Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise. It is not Captain Spock and the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Um, right now, I gather it's all about budget and they want to shoot the next film on a lower budget because Beyond didn't perform as expected despite the good reviews because Into Darkness sucks so much. <laughs> uh, the box office got hurt. Yeah. And so they want to do the film on a lower budget, which means the cast is getting is being offered less money and Pine is like, yeah, I got a deal, guys. Pay me what I'm worth. And my issue is because Star Trek came out in 2009 and the earliest you're going to get a, a fourth Star Trek film is 2019 – you're a decade out, and this is supposed to be Kirk straight out of the Academy a couple of years into his run as Captain Kirk. The guy's going to be 40-something, and I think they really <laughs> botched that by by not coming out and dealing with them as, as these young workies. I hear you, man. That's true. That's a, that's a very good point. No, it'll be interesting. I'm also optimistic after the most recent uh, Star Trek news – uh, that they got some Rick and Morty, Morty writers to write a cartoon, uh, and uh, it's about. Did you hear this uh, news story? Yep. Yeah. All right, out of boy. I figured. 
<laughs> well, there's, there's Trek, been yeah. talk, and I knew other people who had pitched animated ideas uh, to them as well. Uh, it just shows the tremendous appeal of Star Trek to a variety of people. You look at Seth MacFarlane and the Orville. You look at the Black Mirror episode that was pretty yes. much a Star Trek story. Yes. There are all these people who were so influenced by Star Trek, they're paying homage to it in their own ways. So the Rick and Marty guys want to do Star Trek? If it's a well-done Star Trek, have at it. If it's a funny Star Trek, have at it because... Let's face it, second season, we had some very funny episodes uh, back in the 60s. So, you know, the concept lends itself. I know Gene Roddenberry wasn't a particularly big fan of Trouble with Tribbles and uh, I-Mud, but the fans responded to it. Great it was episodes. based humor. So yep. As long as you stay that way, I think you're fine. I agree, and I also think, uh, yeah, basically what you're saying is that uh, Star Trek as a you know pop culture iconic symbol is strong enough to handle parody, and I think and yeah I mean again like you say there's all these parodies around it. I do you like the Orville? I'm going to admit it's on the to watch list. Oh, you haven't seen it yet? Okay. No, my, you know here here's the issue these days. There's so much out there. Oh, oh, absolutely, man. 100%. It's like you know. No, you know, like I'm trying to race through Iron Fist because Daredevil's about to drop and Daredevil <laughs> drops and I'm trying to get through that so I can I can get to Orville season one before season two starts in the uh, winter. You know, it's like it's just so much and I can't I can't keep up. There's just oh, no man. way. Yeah, I totally you know? understand, Bob. Absolutely, uh, man. You're you know, it's like I'm so proud of myself that I've already seen the first two Doctor Who's and Teen Titans. It was like, can I keep up? Probably not. Now, okay, so let's talk about Teen Titans for a second. Yeah, and uh, DC Universe, what do you think? Uh, it looks better than I uh, had expected. Um, tonally, it is not what I wanted. Uh, I, I totally, wholeheartedly disagree with the interpretation of Dick Grayson. Um, and yet, I'm enjoying it. I, you know, I, I, I thought the Hawk and Duff were wonderful, well Me cast. Too. Um, I'm glad Mika Kelly's not dead. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I I so much prefer the Chuck Dixon interpretation of Robin. Who this is a kid of acrobats in the circus, and this is a guy who takes joy, who is not the everything Batman isn't. And this Dick Grayson on this Titan show is, is a rebellious but equally dark Batman. I don't I need that. Yeah, you know, he's Jason Todd, and I, it didn't even occur to me until someone said that. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. They're making Dick act like Jason Todd. And that would have – I mean, it wouldn't – you'd have to have a whole you know, explanation, possibly, or go, why is this guy Robin and why isn't uh, Dick Grayson Robin if you were to go with Jason? Um, but I agree with you as well in terms of um, – at my initial thought was it's dark, it's gritty. Oh, here we go again. Haven't they learned? All that said, I am enjoying the show. And like you said, I loved Hawk and Dove. That was fantastic. Um, and I, I'm, I'm accepting the, the, the choices that they made that differ from the book. And all that said, I'm like, no, I'm actually going to stick around. I like this, and, I'm, and I will watch it all the way through. And as we know, being older and stuff, a lot of great shows have a rough first season. And I think Star Trek Discovery is another example of that, where it's like, okay, I didn't agree with a lot of what they did. But I'm certainly going to come back for the second season because there was enough there that I liked. And exactly. every, every, I mean, God, the first season of Next Generation is tough to get through, I think. Oh, sure. Uh, you don't get – Star Trek The Next Generation is very tough to get through until you get to the second season Measure of a Man episode. And, and all Agreed. of a sudden you see its potential. Yep. Well, and they always say when once Riker has facial hair, then you know it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad rule of thumb. You know, the, each Star Trek had rough openings because different reasons. Obviously, Next Generation had so much behind the scenes chaos that's been well documented over the years that you have a sense that the fact that they got 26 episodes out at all is a testament to the crew. Um, DS9 really didn't find its footing at first. Uh, yeah. You know, Voyager had a great premise and then went in an entirely different way. And it had its it had moments of brilliance. I don't think it ever gelled as it should have. And Enterprise effectively sucked until Manny Cotto stepped in and started bringing the Star Trek back to the show. I agree. 
<laughs> totally, man. Well, and again, it's that general attitude of, and it was it was disappointing in Enterprise because there's always that beard stroking moment of the aliens going, ah, these humans. They have potential. Maybe maybe they will make an impact on this universe. And it's like, oh, whatever. But luckily, in Broken Bow, you get that moment where Trip and uh, and um, Jolene Blaylock, and shame on me, uh, what's her name? To, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, help me. What's her name on the Which show? Which character? Helping uh, Jolene Blaylock's uh, character. To Paul. Tapal, yes. Yeah, Tapal Tapal and Trip are are in the space station. They see the alien mother trying to wean her baby off of uh, a respirator and learning how to breathe air and the, and the kid looks like it's gagging. And Trip's like, "Hey, leave that kid alone." And Tapal's like, "No, she's just being a mother teaching her kid how to breathe regular air." And basically the attitude is, "Guess what, humans? This is a big universe." And you're taking your first steps. You don't know everything. Yeah, you're going to screw up. And I wanted, I wanted Archer and the Enterprise to screw up more. And and, yes. and not and not in any non heroic way, but like yeah, you see that sometimes with the best intentions, you fuck up, and, and things don't go the way they should. And that would have been a much more interesting show. But once again, it's like ah, here come the humans. Oh, they're so brilliant. We 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 misunderstood them. And it's like, all right, we've we've seen this show. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things Discovery could also do um, to bridge this between Enterprise and the William Shatner Star Trek is use some of the alien races introduced in Enterprise. Like, would, like, the, you know, like the Andorians, you mean? or Not the Andorians, no. They introduced new races that, oh. you know, first contact stories plus, plus the, the bad guys from season two. Those are alien races that we have not seen since. That would That's be true. interesting to see it in, in the discovery time, you know, a generation later. That's a good point. Absolutely. No, I'd, I'd like to see that. Absolutely. I also hope it's funny, as weird and as bad as, well, first of all, and I and honestly, I always got to put this like preface on it. Michelle Yeoh is a brilliant actor, and I'm really glad that um, she's part of Star Trek. But I really hated uh, the, the idea of her Mirror Universe character, and also in that horrible cliffhanger Saturday morning fashion that they bring her back to, you know, the regular universe and that she slips away. Mwahaha. It's like, really? Oh, my God. Shame on you. This is Star Trek. We expect smarter stories than that. But who I really want to see, and hopefully maybe he survived, his regular Star Trek universe uh, version survived, I'd love to see uh, Jason Isaacs back as... You know the the real captain, if he had survived and and hadn't died, as you know is suspected in in season one, because yep. I thought he was great. And again, yes, I thought Michelle Yeoh was fine, but um, you know, again, I just didn't. I I, I thought she was too evil to to be allowed to. Yeah, you know, we're going to pretend she's the captain. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, it just again, it was just dumb writing. Really, really dumb writing in my well, in my view. We can hope for the best. You know. <laughs> People learn. Indeed. New, new blood is there. It's true. Well, we'll see what happens. Absolutely, man. All right. Now, enough, I don't enough. know if you've got time to read any of the novels and stuff, but the interesting thing is that the writer's room has been working with uh, guys like David Mack and David uh, Dayton Ward and James Swallow on uh, the Discovery novels that are out already. And I thought Dayton's uh, novel was just wonderful because it sends Jason Isaacs and Michelle Yeoh's characters to Tarsus for in the wake of Kodos the Executioner. Excellent. Wow. And it is such a great continuity in plant story. That's fantastic. Oh my God. That's great. I love anytime they're back on Tarsus Four and exploring that period because it is dark. And that's really, really interesting. And of course, being such an important part of uh Kirk's story. And I love too uh Kevin Riley, of course. Yes. The good stuff, man. No, exactly. You see that's as always, man, that's when they always find the interesting stories and stuff is those little throwaway lines. I mean, God, Peter David, you know, of his, you know, 20 plus, however many Star Trek books he's written, yeah. always finds an interesting little like throwaway line or throwaway character moment and builds a great story around it. So that's good to hear. And I have been meaning to uh, read the Discovery novels. Uh, my buddy Susan Eisenberg, the female voice of Wonder Woman or uh, female voice, the voice of Wonder Woman in, in the Justice League cartoons. She... Uh, she she I know she narrates uh, one of the audiobooks. So 
of the Discovery ah, novels. I didn't realize that. Good for her. Nice. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's terrific. Um, well, dude, I, I, real fast, Weekly World News, your your, your history there. So, all right. So um, <laughs> uh, DC let me go in January 2006, and I was uh, doing some freelance stuff. And Jeff Rovin, who you, I have known since the 70s through comics fan and all and had been for about 10 minutes in editor D, uh, DC before um, founding Atlas Comics – Somehow wound up at the Weekly World News as its editor, and he had hired Paul Kupperberg, an old buddy of mine, sure. uh, on staff as his uh, executive editor, and they were having the time of their lives. And Jeff heard I was um, out, out of a day job and was looking for stuff, and he started throwing stories my way to write for the Weekly World News. Now, I knew the newspaper. I knew its reputation. I knew its history. I was not a regular reader, and so I, you know, read a couple of issues and pitched some stories, and he threw stories at me and had me run with it. And all of a sudden, I'm writing cover stories for this publication. It's like this is kind of weird. And then uh, internally, they they wanted to keep it, weirdly some of the functions were uh, being run out of their Boca Raton offices of uh, American Media, and the New York offices they wanted to consolidate, and they created a position of managing editor and brought me on full time. So I got there in June of 2006 until um, AMI stupidly folded the paper in August 2007. And so AMI uh, is that is that the Inquirer's uh, company? Yes, yeah, that's Go on. Media. Yeah, they, you know they've done some really silly things. Like you know they had they were publishing Cracked Magazine, and when they tired of it, they sold it to somebody for a buck. Oh my God. They, they gave they gave the rights uh, to Batboy, Nash, uh, you know the Weekly World News's uh, mascot practically, yes. um, to be turned into a musical for like a buck, and they controlled all rights, and uh, AMI couldn't profit off of it. It was just weird business dealings going on. So anyway, I'm there with Paul Kupperberg. The art director was Maddie Blaustein, who worked at uh, Marvel and DC uh, in different capacities through the years was also the voice of Meowth on, on uh, the Pokemon cartoons. And we brought over Christine Schmidt uh, to be one of our art director designers. And the four of us were working. Uh, we were being assisted by a young lady named Jennifer Plastino, who turned out to be the granddaughter of Superman artist Al Plastino. <laughs> and the five of us, put out this 48-page newspaper every week. Jeff worked out of his apartment that came in uh, infrequently, and he basically left us alone. He'd send wow. in stories. He told us, uh, save space for this, uh, assign this to that guy. And we were having the time of our lives. I mean, you know, um, we had added these comic strips, so Paul Kupberg is working with guys like Mike Collins, who, who we know from comics, um, and we were putting this stuff out. Uh, every week I get this wonderful puzzle from Sergio Aragonis that – you know, we have to scan in and, and, and do the answer key for. And working with, you know, veteran writers like Dick Siegel, uh, who had been working on the news for, for years and years, I never had an easier day job than the year and the year plus I was on that paper. And we're putting it out a 48 page weekly, and yet I, I never broke a sweat. Interesting. That's crazy, man. And of course, now AMI, a little notorious in. Uh the uh, the various Trump scandals and everything at David Picker or David Picker not David Picker, it's David Pecker David Pecker David Pecker of course yes has every right to support whoever he wants sure see? but the idea that the Inquirer bought and buried stories I'm you know I'm sure Trump is not the only one he's done this for oh sure and it's questionable ethics and journalism but it's just you know it's his toy he can do as he pleases sure uh, i'm just sorry that when uh, the paper was folded uh we had all these deals in the works to do um licensed merchandise and books and things that never saw fruition that could have saved the paper and then jeff was not given a chance to buy it outright and it was sold to this other guy uh, neil mcginnis uh, sometime later and neil's done an admirable job but um you know unfortunately by the time he got it you know, it was just surpassed by the onion and other uh, sources. Sure, yeah. Well, that's the, that's the crazy thing. Absolutely, man. I mean, you know, it was a comedy newspaper, and it's it should have. And again, having having a flagship character like Bat Boy, you're right. I mean, there's there. I know that there was a little bit of merchandising with Bat Boy. There obviously could have been more. And I mean, you could just see 
uh, T-shirts with headlines and goofy stuff and, you know. Well, we, we had a deal in place with Hallmark for a line of cards. Wow. Uh, we had a, a two-book deal at Random House. So, we, you know, we had a, a whole bunch of stuff in the works that would have gotten this stuff out there. And one of the reasons we did the comic strips beyond Bat Boy was to create IP to exploit. Do you ever? Did you yeah, ever hear a Jeff's reason no why? I'm sorry. Say it again. So Jeff's no fool. He knew how to market this stuff. Did you ever hear a reason why the AMI wanted to uh, get rid of it? It didn't fit their vision of what AMI was because it was the Inquirer and the Star, and it was the Health and Fitness magazines, and, and you know one or two other publications. We were the outlier all of a sudden, even though we were the spinoff from the Inquirer. Yeah. And at the time, they were paying. Something like four million a year to Walmart alone to um, be racked at the at the checkout counter, and, it, and maybe CVS was part of that too. And they were saying, you know, that's a lot of money. Maybe you know we're not getting the returns we used to. You know, maybe it's time to, to you know cancel it. Meantime, Paul and the, had convinced the sales team to allow Diamond to take the publication direct only and put it in comic shops. And that would have been a second revenue stream that would have saved us. And AMI said, no, thank you. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, they just kept saying no or we don't believe it, even though we had contracts on our hands showing that we, we were going to be licensing and merchandising this stuff. Well, again, their, uh, their current actions and the things that have been revealed uh, recently, I think, speak a lot for what AMI is. So that's very, very interesting. But uh, is Jeff Rovin still with us? Is he still around? Yes, he is. Um, he he's done some co-writing. Uh, he's done a bunch of Tom Clancy branded books, and uh, uh, just did uh, one or two with William Shatner. Also, uh, some, some new property I'm, I'm really not familiar with. Uh, Jeff continues. He just keeps a very very low profile. Oh man, I don't know if he'd be. I, I'm going to have to hit you up and see if he'd be willing to come on a word balloon because man, I'm the whole Atlas of the '70s period is fascinating to me. And also, yeah, all of his books. I mean, my God, like you said, has been such a writer of uh, the co-writing that you're just talking about. But also, I remember a lot of his uh, fan history writings that he's oh, done he, over he the years. He did fan history writing back in the 70s, like the superhero or supervillain encyclopedias he did. Uh, he's done a, a tremendous amount of stuff. He's also done some original fiction that was actually quite good. Um, you know, so he's very versatile. Yeah, no, interesting guy. Absolutely, man. And, uh, you know, uh, am I? Uh, do you want to wrap up? I don't want to keep you too long if you yeah. if you got other stuff. To, all right, well, let, can I uh, ask about Starlog? Because sure. I was I was such a Starlog fan. My God. And uh, I got to say, for, for people interested, Internet Archive, you, you, you can pull down uh, PDFs and other formats of, of the magazine, and it's it's all up there. And they're, they're wonderful. It's a wonderful look back at uh, the coverage of – science fiction and horror and fantasy as the stuff was happening. And I, I was, I was a huge fan of the magazine from the, when I was aware of it in the seventies, uh, all, all through the nineties and everything. It was great stuff. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I, I remember buying the first issue on the newsstand in 1976. And when I was applying for jobs in the spring of 1980, it never occurred to me. I'd wind up there. It was just, I was applying to anyone who printed anything, I, you know, sure. newspapers, magazines, book houses, and I threw Starla again because what the hell? And yet they were the only ones who uh, act, actually brought me in for a job interview. Wow. How long were you with them? I joined them in uh, September 1980 and left to join DC in January 1984. That's so while I was there, I came on to – um, be the managing editor of Fangoria, which I did for about a year. Wow. Uh, at which time I was also an assistant editor at Starlog, uh, which basically meant I wrote pieces for them and, and helped proofread. And while I was there, I created Comic Scene. And Comic Scene, uh, great magazine. Go on. Thank you. And when Comic Scene was green lit, I was moved off uh, from Fangoria, which made an opening for. Uh, for Dave Everett, uh, which was a fabulous addition because um, he had the better temperament uh, for the horror magazine at the time. And I worked on the comic scene and continued to contribute and proofread for Starlog and Fangoria and a couple of their other licensed magazines along the way. And had a tremendous amount of fun 
But then they canceled the magazine. And it's again, it's one of those things where our circulation director, Dick Brown, was showing me sales were on the way up and yet they canceled it. So I have no idea why. So, you know, they put me on their boxing and wrestling and, and their auto magazines, which were not to my taste. Okay. Not my interest. <laughs> and uh, I made it known to DC and Marvel that I could be had. And then finally in December 1983, uh, this year Donald calls me in for an interview. Uh, I, I much later learned uh, I was kind of a plan B. Dick had the money to add the staff, and he really wanted to bring Denny over for Marvel because he was withering under Jim Shooter's uh, uh, tenure as head yeah, chief. Yeah. Uh, but then he was having some health issues and didn't want to jeopardize his health insurance and, and turn Dick down. Uh, later joining DC in, uh, I guess it was uh, late 8, 1985. Uh, so Dick took the money and realized Len and Mark were going to need help on, on Crisis and Who's Who. So they hired me as an assistant editor and Dick wound up saving money in the process. So everybody won. Wow. Insane, man. That's that's terrific. Wow. Any, any good Crisis uh, stories? Oh, uh, you know, it's hard to see what's considered a good story and what, what's been told a million times. I have to say, uh, initially, at minimum, once a week, we would t- bring in lunch and the three of us would sit in the conference room and try and brainstorm what the story was going to be. And we had every idea possible. And at one point, we ran down to Julie Schwartz's office. He always kept a, a series of um, uh, science books. Um to have the pseudoscience make some sense in his comics and we borrowed a bunch and we realized the atom was split for the first time in 1938 superman was published in 1938 can we come up with some connection and we were all excited until we said now there's no story here yet but you know it was things like that interesting uh and and then finally it became clear that um, given what was going on at the offices at the time and in Lennon Marv's uh, lives at that time, uh, it made more sense to split the split the projects. So have Len focus on on who's who, have Marv focus on the crisis, and I would be the conduit between the two. Uh, so you know, I'm sitting there in Dijerdano's office with Marv, breaking the news to Julie and Carrie Bates that not only were we killing the Flash, we're canceling his book, and Jesus. Yeah. And you know we're gonna we're gonna we have to do this, and which is where we came up with we'll do it for the 350th issue so you can get to the milestone, which unfortunately I think stretched out the trial of the Flash way too long. But it also meant saying to Julie, by the way, we're killing Supergirl too. Wow, you know, so that was a tough conversation. Sure. And there were there were times where we were really debating: do we really want to kill the Flash? Can we just take his powers away? And then finally somebody said no because a lazy writer on a day he's stuck for a story is going to say, I'll just give him his powers back. Interesting. Wow. And he said, no, it's got to be something more permanent. And it's got to be – if we're going to merge the Earths and we're going to make this, this big cosmic story, there have to be consequences. It can't just be C-level villains like the bug-eyed bandit who die. It sure. has to be consequential sure. characters. Oh, God, that uh... – those moments, God, when uh, Psycho Pirate is, you know, begging uh, Flash's costume, you know, and, and basically saying, I'm sorry, you're dead. Please come back. And uh, that was an amazing moment. The uh, I mean, you know, Flash's death uh, was incredible and watching him just, you know, ebb away into a skeleton and then nothing. Oh, my God. Great stuff, man. I mean, yeah. And, and you know, of course, Superman weeping with uh Kara's body in his arms oh my god you know just oh, yeah, yeah it was it was it was such an incredible story it's funny because you know i i i had marv on uh, in my first year of work and i asked him about crisis and he was like just like you said initially it's like jesus i've told this story a million times how many more goddamn times do i have to tell it you know and i'm like all right man it's cool <laughs> no problem well, you don't have to tell it here you know the thing is that you look back at crisis and again now that we've hit the um 30th anniversary oddly enough um and, and we're celebrating it, and we're and DC is finally collecting the crossover issues, um, the first volume which is just coming out. It's real interesting to look back at it, and, and as I've done some uh, writing for the, for these collections, uh, I've had to re, you know refamiliarize myself with the material. And Marv and George crammed everybody into these major crowd scenes and major fight scenes, and yet 
they also stopped and made sure we had human moments. Yes. You know, in issue four, when Supergirl and Batgirl are just sitting there talking, and Batgirl's having this crisis of faith, or um, moments where the characters stop and are talking to each other and having human moments, so that when they're about to go into battle and they, you know, it falls to the wall action, it you feel something. You, you're rooting for them. Uh, I think some of the mega stories that have followed have sometimes lost that you know give me those character moments agreed well and i i think you're right in events in general you're right it's all about the action and they forget and they don't let these stories breathe and it kind of gets me angry uh something that marvel was doing and it'll be interesting to see moving forward now that cb's in charge if it changes but um the event would take place in five issues they would have tie-in issues like a spider-man event they'd have tie-in issues and amazing and all the emotional human beats were happening in the tie-in and it's like no man you need it in the event comic itself uh, you're that's wrong and, and then if it's too if it's you know you don't have enough space then make the event longer maybe five issues shouldn't be you know there's a reason why crisis needed to be 12 issues plus all the tie-ins that you had not, one of my not, favorite not just that think about it issue one was 32 no ad pages number seven wow. number 12 were double-sized Wow, I did forget all that. Holy cow. Well, and that, for me, one of the best human moments is when the Golden Age Superman is ready to step in the void and just be like, well, if my world doesn't exist, then I shouldn't exist. And Earth-1 Superman pulls him back. And that classic last, and it is an action moment, it's great that the Golden Age Superman has the final punch because it's like, you're goddamn right. He's the first hero. And that's, I was really happy when uh, in Kingdom Come, also reflected in, Justice League's 100 Greatest Moments. Uh, the, or I should say it's uh, in um, the Justice Society's Thy Kingdom Come when they brought back the Kingdom Come Superman, and he kind of represented the Golden Age Superman. And Absolutely. It's like, you, you, need, you need Earth 2 Superman. You need him because he is the first hero. And, and he has that. And I love that about Infinite Crisis when Jeff brought him back and there's a great human moment when he talks to earth one Superman and he's like, Bruce, I know you don't know who I am, but I know you and I know you're the one man I can trust. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> every reader is going, there you go. God damn yeah. right. These are those guys, man. He gets it. You know, I just recently read um, the, the, I guess Marvel's most recent mega crossover, the, uh, the, the Avengers, no surrender book. Uh huh. And it's got three different writers and it's got, it was like 15, 16 issues long. And it's interesting because there are a couple of human moments, and I, I kept w- wanting more. And I think, I you know, I, I, th- I know it was supposed to be an all out action, uh, big cosmic storyline with Earth caught in between, you know, the, the warring factions of the elders. But, you know, when, when you cripple Jarvis and you make him a plot line, I did, did, you needed more Jarvis. I can appreciate that. Sure. No, I hear you, man. Well, and again, a JLA versus Avengers. There's a lot of great little, and then thankfully, you know, they Busick and Perez were able to get some good, even brief human moments. My favorite is when uh, Captain America and Batman size each other up, and they don't throw a punch, and it's like, all right, clearly there's not going to be a winner in this fight. Let's skip the fight and let's get to, let's get to battle planning and figure out what we should do. Well, and it was. Uh- Kurt, Kurt is from that same era uh, that, that I am, where we were trained under editors who wanted character, who, who said it's got to be you know character first stuff. That's great to hear, man, because I really th- um, I think a guy like Brian Bendis understands that. And Brian always put it this way and said, look, we've seen these guys hit each other a million times. But we haven't heard every conversation between a lot of these characters. And I think there's something to be said for that. And I think decompression got a bad rap, I think, in the early 2000s. And and maybe, you know, it's it's a pendulum. Maybe it swung too far that way that things were slowed down too much. But, yeah, you need that, you need that balance. We've seen – and especially – I, well, I think younger readers appreciate that as well, but you, you need those you need those human moments between the characters. I mean, back to the Avengers for a second. When Brian Bendis took over the Avengers, they talked to each other. Yeah, <laughs> they may have talked too much, but no. I mean, there was dialogue. There was there was, and each voice was distinct enough, and they would argue different points of view before they go into action. And I thought that was really good. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm glad people like Jonathan Hickman and now Jason Aaron are, you know, continuing that. We're, we're they actually have conversations in, um, as part of the story. Agreed, a hundred percent, man. No, you're right, and I and I do believe that uh, you know Tom King, I think, is doing a tremendous job on Batman, and uh, was doing a great job at Marvel too with his uh, his Vision story. And uh, yeah, I mean, I. I I was okay with Grant's uh, Batman. I, there were some of it I loved, some of it I was okay with. Uh, was never, oddly, was not a fan of the Scott Snyder stuff, and kept looking at everyone falling all over themselves, telling me how great it is. Then to me, it was like, eh, "Where's Bruce Wayne? Where's Batman? Where's the character?" Uh, and and some of these stories were just stack, beggared the imagination. And then Tom comes in, and it's all character, and, and I'm loving it. That's cool. No, I I hear you. And yeah, for me, I liked the Snyder run. The only left turn that I didn't care for was when they put Jim Gordon in the uh, robot suit. And oh, that um, made no sense whatsoever. Yeah, well, and I think honestly, I think it was. And and uh, Scott, if you're listening, forgive me, but I, I assumed part of it was that Greg Capullo likes drawing big robots, so as throwing him a bone of, hey, let me let, let me give you something that you're going to enjoy. But uh, it makes no sense in his character. I agree with that. Well, and further, I just thought the story went too long because another great conversation that – well, first of all, Scott did that Black Mirror story with Dick Grayson and Jim Gordon Jr. That was incredible, and it's really one of the best Batman stories where Bruce Wayne's not even in the story, but it was when Dick was Batman, and it was really, really great. Well, in- don't get me started on Jim Gordon Jr. <laughs> well, he's there, and again, much like making Cybok matter, they made Jim Gordon Jr. in. But Jim Gordon Jr. makes no sense. Well, but it goes back to, you know, he was in uh, year one with Miller. He was in year Mexico. one when Batman was 25, and now all of a sudden he's this adult. I kind of liked it. I got to be honest. Then no, I, I mean, well. but he does. The, I, I was having this conversation with Mike Martz when, when the story started running, when, when Mike was the Batman. And I said, you understand this guy was, was, was an infant when Batman That's was true. 25. And, and we're 10 years later. The, the kid should be 10 years old, not 25 years old. I hear you. No, and I'm Mark, Mike you know. was like. Huh. I never thought about that. And well, things like why. that drive me nuts. Well, you know, that's that's like soap that's like classic soap opera, man, where it's a little kid on General Hospital and they send him to summer camp and all of a sudden he's eighteen years old and having love affairs and everything. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, it's like another thing that Bendis always says. It's like, yeah, man, comic books are like a quilt and if you if you pluck the the, the thread too hard, the whole thing's gonna unravel. So no, I get what you're saying from that standpoint. But and, what I was gonna you know, say uh, right now, you know, in, in the superheroines book, I had to explain, you know, that there was some conscious editorial decision to de-age Barbara Gordon when, um, uh, you know, when uh, Cameron, St- right, it was Cameron Stewart, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, company stepped in to take over the book. All of a sudden, she she lost about eight years of her life. That's true. Well, you know, supposedly, and I don't know if they're going to address it with Batgirl. But you know that's kind of the story now with uh, Doomsday Clock and uh, the you know Doctor Manhattan messing with the DC universe and everything because Wally lost like ten years, and you know no, while, I mean, Wally was there's a definite five year gap that that was established when when Wally came out of wherever he went and he said five years are missing from everybody's life and people are starting to piece it together and I'm still waiting for the, for that to be fully explained, but there was something about Barbara where it just happened and. So much of her history has now been altered, and and the whole dynamic of her being the older woman to Dick Grayson in their yes. romance is now reversed. Yes, and it just changes everything. And I'm not sure there was a need. I hear you, man. No, I agree. Well, same thing with Marvel uh, and uh, Betty Brant, and all of a sudden uh, her relationship with Peter Parker was inappropriate, and it's like, well, she's an older woman, and I'm like, why? I never thought that. I'm like, I always thought Betty was just a kid that never went to college and right after high school started working at the newspaper. Yeah, I'm like, which most she must have been what a couple of years older tops. Right, right, and that's my point. And it's just like, hey man, you guys are the ones that are making it creepy. I'm like, there's no, there was nothing wrong with Betty being a little older than Peter. Uh, you know, I hear you, man, and I do remember those great uh, '70s uh, Batman family stories, and and both in their own books as well. When Barbara was a congresswoman, and and uh, Dick was just out of high school, and and you know, doing his first solo things pre Titans. Absolutely, man, interesting stuff. Well, and I was going to say the one great conversation that Snyder had, and it was near the end of his run, 
was when uh, Bruce Wayne, you know, had been cured of his Batman complex, and he's sitting on the park bench with Joker, and Joker's in kind of a human makeup. And he's like, you ever think uh, that you're somebody else and maybe you should be that other person? And uh, Bruce is like, actually, yes. And he goes, let me tell you something. Don't do it. And it was great. <laughs> and it was this really chilling conversation with the Joker basically telling Bruce, hey, if you come back, I got to come back. And this isn't going to end well. So stay away. And okay, then of course, I'll, I'll give you that one. You know, I mean, that. <laughs> but no, I do think that Snyder's. It, it just ran too long. I just felt like it ran too long. It was like, all right, let's get to this conclusion. I just felt like it was, you know, yeah, just kind of, and and not that they weren't, well, they just weren't stories that spoke to me. So what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. I, but anyway. Sure. Um, but, you know, dude, it's like everyone, you know, I'm in the minority. I recognize I'm an outlier uh, with my opinion about Scott's run. And, you know, if people were entertained that DC made a fistful of money, so be it. Oh, absolutely, man. No, Scott's doing. Hey, Scott's doing fine. <laughs> it's it's all good. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I definitely am much more enjoying his Justice League run at the moment. I hear you, man. Crazy Eight. Uh, you're 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 part of Crazy Eight yes, Publishing. Crazy right? Eight Press. Yes. It, is that yours or is that? Uh, so uh, you... this was it really gelled in a conversation amongst uh, a handful of writers at Sure Leave, which is a Baltimore-based uh, science fiction convention, and. Um, we had seen the rise of digital publishing. So we're going back to about 2011 now and the iPad had come out. Ebooks were the thing. And a lot of us were suddenly bumping our heads against publishers who were still trying to figure out how to monetize ebooks. And they kept saying no to things or they kept saying, great idea. I can't sell it. You know, one, one of the things that most annoys me about publishing today is, the marketing department has more authority than editorial. So the marketing says, I don't know how to sell this. We can't publish it. I would say, give me a new marketing guy who can sell it. I hear but, you. Again, I'm in the minority. But we all were looking at each other going, we all have ideas. We all have things that we want to do that we can't do to sell for one reason or another. Why don't we do it ourselves? We've seen other people launching their own. But we recognize the strength in numbers. So we said, all right, let's coalesce. Let's come together. Uh, we started with eight of us, and the roster is altered a little bit. So we're, you know, we're sitting on seven at the moment. Uh, but for the last uh, seven years or so, we have been out uh, pu putting out uh, at our schedule. We're not adhering to any schedule other than we have a book we're proud of and we're ready to release. Uh, today, November 1st, um, one of the members, Russ Colchimiro, just released um, a brand new edition of uh, his first novel, Finders Keepers. Uh, and uh, the next one is probably going to be a couple months down the road. It's whenever people are done and are ready. Uh, I'm working on uh, the 2019 annual anthology. We, we have fallen into the habit of doing one, which acts as a sampler for all of our work. Smart. And uh, each year it's a different theme. And uh, this past year we did Let's They Keep Killing Glenn, uh, which was a collection of stories where we kill one of our own, Glenn Hellman. Um, because Glenn is a lovable guy, but invariably everyone finds some reason they want to kill him. So Peter David said, we should all do that and get it out of our systems. <laughs> so, it, all right, so Peter David's part of it. Paul yes, Peter David, part Michael of Jan Friedman, uh, who worked with me on the Star Trek books, uh, sure. both, both gentlemen, and Mike did uh, Star, Dark Stars for DC as well. And awesome. Russ Colchimiro, Aaron Rosenberg, Paul Copperberg. Uh, Mary Fan, Glenn Hallman, myself. Uh, so there are seven of us, and we've got a quite quite a nice little backlist of fantasy and science fiction and one or two nonfiction books. Uh, in fact, um, Rob Kelly, um, his Hey Kids comics made its debut as a Crazy Eight Press title as a oh, nonfiction sure. essay collection. Uh, you know, so if there's something we believe in by somebody else, uh, every now and then we will, you know, uh, do that. Um, we are, we are supporting one another. We are making sure that we are there. So when something like Russ's new book comes out today, we're all promoting it in social media. Again, so the numbers to get the word out because, you know, you can self publish, but who's going to notice? I'm hip. Yeah, 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 man. No, no. It's a crowded Virtual shelf and and hard uh, hard shelf as well. 
So, no, I'm really glad you guys are doing this. And, yeah, I, I loved uh, I loved Paul's uh, book about uh, comics in the 50s, and I'm forgetting the name of it right now, uh, that he wrote. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, no, you got a lot of heavy hitters over there, so that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's great when, you know, Peter has all these great stories because, uh, obviously, he is our most commercially successful writer in the group, and he's got all these stories about, I'm publishing this through Crazy 8 because... I was told men can't write vampire stories. You know, Crazy. Stupid. Thanks to Twilight, but everyone forgot Bram Stoker, apparently. So, <laughs> Or you can't do funny vampire stories. It's like, why not? Ridiculous. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, nonsense like that. Um, Peter, Peter had a book, Languishing a Tour, um, that was way past its contractual obligation to be published. It was the second book of a trilogy. And Tor just wasn't getting to it. So Peter invoked his right of uh, reversion. And it's uh, called The Hidden Earth. Uh, Tor published book one. He got the rights back to book one. He published books two and three. And we finally, he finally got the story out that he wanted to tell. That's awesome. That's great, man. And that's the joys of self-publishing. I hear you. Well, I'm glad to hear that, man, because I know others. Uh, I know Chuck Dixon's doing great with his e-books and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Chuck started doing that stuff. Uh, in fact, I edited one of his first SEAL Team 6 books for Dynamite, and he recognized, you know, he could do this on his own, and he just went off and, and did this. And yeah. It was tremendous. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy for him. No, I, I, I hear you, and I, and I feel the same way. And, um, uh, yeah, I just think this is a great thing. I don't know. Is Englehart uh, still uh, – I know he was doing some uh, books and, and everything. I don't know if he's – uh, still... I talked to him at Terrificon last year, 2017, and I thought he still had a book uh, he was working on. So I'm, I'm waiting to hear when it's available. I got you. I got you. I'm sorry. I was at this year's Terrificon, so I'm sorry I missed you okay. last year's Terrificon. And, uh, you know, you guys got like Elliot Magan, who somehow managed to retain the rights to, to print uh, his Superman novels. Yes. And, and he's gone great? back and done some original work of his own. So he's self publishing and, and more power to him. Absolutely, man. No, that's. Hey man, that's the thing. You guys, you guys are great writers, and it's uh, if yeah, if like you said, if the publishers are too stupid and don't know how to market these things, it's like, no, I'm glad. And and again, luckily with social media, I think a lot of your fans will be very happy to hear that uh, the the stuff is out there and that you guys are doing it. So, well, again, you know. even though there was strength in numbers and our ability to to sh- you know have eight of us or seven of us shout out when we have a new release, there are still times people will come to us at the shows and go, "When are you going to publish something new?" And it's like, "I had a book out four months ago. Where were you?" And somehow they still miss it. And we, we're trying to build up our newsletter uh, e- mailing list so we can keep people informed and. We'll try as many channels as possible. It's just bizarre. Tell us how to get the uh, the newsletter. Well, we're crazy dot com, and that's numeral eight. And um, there's a box on the homepage. You just drop us your email address, and we will add you our mailing list. Uh, we are not inundating people with newsletters unless there's something we want to share with you, such as a new release or a convention appearance. I hear you, man. Bob, this is great. I'm really glad that uh, everything is going well and uh, that the writing continues. And again, we're getting great collections like uh, these two great coffee table books that are absolutely uh, things you should consider for your uh, Christmas list for your uh, favorite uh, comic book fan that uh, wants to learn more about their favorite thing. Justice League, 100 Greatest Moments. DC Comics Superheroines, 100 Greatest Moments from Robert Greenberg and Greenberger, excuse me. And... uh, I'm uh, yeah, man. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and let's not wait years for our next conversation. When uh, when the new yeah, whenever something's ready and you want to talk, there's a lot more that we could talk about. Sure, John, you've been very kind, and uh, I appreciate having the, the opportunity to just chit chat. Because you know, um, when you're sitting at your desk, or in my case, my classroom, I, I don't have these conversations as often <laughs> as I used to. So this has been <laughs> lovely. Anytime, man. It's uh, thanks again for coming on. Sure, John. There you go, Bob Greenberger. Two great books right now that you should check out from Chartwell Books, DC Comics Superheroines, 100 Greatest Moments, and DC Comics Justice League, 100 Greatest Moments, and uh, that third volume coming early next year. Really great stuff. I think they'd make excellent Christmas gifts for uh, fans that are really into comic book history. They are really detailed and have very interesting stories. 
and I think uh, will provide some interesting debate amongst uh, your friends as well. This episode of Word Balloon was again brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, as always, for your continued support via Patreon. If you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, you can go to my webpage, wordballoon.com, click on the Patreon ad there, or go to patreon.com slash wordballoon. Thanks again for listening. Looking forward to talking to you later in the month with uh, more great conversations here on Word Balloon. Uh, Really great stuff. Uh, Interesting people already booked to talk and also a couple in the can that I can't wait to share with you as well. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2018.